Hello there! Welcome to Skeleton Key Productions. I'm Connor Grace Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video we're asking the question of what if India was never partitioned? So, as always with our videos, we're going to give a little bit of context because uh, this is a very uh, controversial and complicated uh, uh, topic as well as many of our uh, videos are and we're going to kind of be dispelling some of the common narratives which kind of uh, surround the uh, partition of India so definitely you know stay tuned for, for this video because it, we're going to go into a lot of detail so without further ado we're going to dive into some of the basic history of uh, you know India before the partition. So first of all what we mean when we talk about India yeah in this video we're going to be talking about India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, right? Because this is what became known as like the British Raj. But before kind of talking about that, we'll talk about some of like the deeper history, right? So obviously like India has had like a majority like kind of a, a Hindu uh, population for, for most of its history, going back like thousands of years. But then obviously with the uh, rise of Islam, you end up having a lot of uh, Muslims uh, coming in from the West, yeah, so far like, from the Middle East. And on top of that, you had like the Mongol invasions. So the Mongols, you know, they, they didn't actually manage to, to conquer India. However, you know, by pushing out lots of different groups, yeah, from like Central Asia, you end up having a thing where many of these groups then decided to come in and invade India. So for instance, you had the Delhi Sultanate, um, and that basically took over a large uh, swath of like uh, of Indian territory, especially in like the north of the country. And then after that, you had basically you know, you end up having someone who was descended from uh, the, the Mongols, but wasn't explicitly a Mongol, right? And uh, this is uh, Babur, I think it's oh, Bab Babur, I don't know how to pronounce the name, sorry, sorry, my pronunciation really going to be bad in this video, apologies in advance. But anyway, Babur, he was the founder of what became the Mughal Empire, right? So the Mughal Empire and taken over a vast wave of the uh, subcontinent, you know, like all the way down to uh, Tamil Nadu. Well, we've got friends from like many different uh, regions, like kind of uh, around like, you know, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, et etc. And um, and it's quite interesting, you know, I've listened to two of my Tamil friends the other uh, month, you know, they were quite drunk and stuff, yeah, but they were kind of going, ah, oh, yo, Tamil Nadu, yeah, look at this map, look at this map, yeah, we, we were never conquered by the moguls here, and we're like, okay, cool, yeah, <laughs> we're trying to go to a nightclub now, just, just it's not, it's not really a time for this, um, but anyway, yeah, so, so they end up taking over all of the, of the place, apart from Tamil Nadu and a, a few other places, right, so, the point with this is that, you know, the, like if you have a situation where you've got Muslim rulers and you've got a Hindu uh, majority population, how they govern that is going to be, you know, if it's done in the wrong way, it's going to lead to a lot of problems. Yeah. And in the early days, there wasn't really this many problems. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it was actually quite a lot of uh, tolerance. Right. So whereas in most other um, Muslim places, uh, you had a thing where, you know, so Muslims, I tended to like uh, look down on people who weren't uh, people of the book. So, so you, you had like obviously Christians and Jews. Um, so, people who were not Christians or Jews, yeah. So people who are like polytheists, yeah, like Hindus, for instance, yeah. They were looked down on by many Muslims uh, in many different uh, places. But because in India you had such a huge uh, disparity yeah, between the the Muslim invaders, yeah, and like the general population. You know the rulers there became a lot more tolerant because they was like, okay, we're not going to be able to govern all these people by thinking that they're basically infidels. Yeah, that that's not really that's not going to be good vibes. Yeah, so as a result of this tolerance, it led to explosion of like kind of of uh, cross cultural and like cross religious uh, kind of uh, cooperation and like you know cultural influences and stuff. Yeah, and it was a great deal of harmony. I'm not saying everything was all rosy and stuff. Yeah, but for the most part, it tended to be relatively well governed right in a kind of pluralistic way however by like the kind of uh, late 17th uh, century and like early 18th century what you started to have was kind of a return to kind of like uh, more like uh, orthodox islam and so as a result we had more uh, 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 kind of laws against uh, different like hindu practices and trying to like get people to like convert to islam etc etc and this obviously caused a lot of tension with people and during this time, you know, like the Mughal Empire, it did have competing like uh, factions within it. Uh, different rulers wanted to take over the crown, etc., etc. But this lack of like kind of um, tolerance, which there had been in previous uh, centuries and stuff, yeah, didn't really help them. And it was one of the many things. Obviously, when an empire declines, there's many things that contribute to it collapsing. But this is one of the things which really didn't help it, and and you know, it was a catalyst to their overall uh, decline. So who ended up taking over after the, the Mughals, right? Well, 
as we can imagine, uh, there was many different uh, European powers here because this was the age of discovery. This when the Europeans went all around the world in search of spices and, and silks and all these kind of things, right? And India obviously had these things by the bucket load, right? The Mughal Empire, you know, I think in 1700, yeah, I think it was either the largest or the second largest economy in like the whole world and certainly by population, I believe it had something like 23% of the world's population. And so, you know, covering a vast, the vast territory and stuff, right? But bit by bit, the European powers started to come in and set up their own uh, uh, trading companies, right? So you had Dutch East India Trading Company, you had the French East India Company, and of course you end up having the most famous of all, which was the English, which later became the British East India Trading Company, right? And these companies, the way to think about it is like the equivalent of like Facebook or Google or someone, yeah, having their own army and their own government and like administering like uh, the territory of like you know millions of square miles can you know, containing like millions of people right that's kind of how to think about the east india trading company so you know the british obviously has became more powerful end up kicking out uh, a lot of these uh, other ones or at least like sidelining a lot of the other uh, competing european powers and yeah and so in time the british east india company ended up basically taking over vast ways of india now, while the East India Company had taken over vast uh, swathes of this territory, what ended up happening is that you end up having, uh, in 1857, the Sepoy Rebellion, or the Indian Mutiny, or as many different names and stuff, depending on like who's uh, saying it, right? Yeah, but during this time, what you have to understand is that the East India Company uh, used uh, uh, native uh, forces, much in the same way as the later uh, British Raj would uh, do, yeah, right? And so these soldiers, you know, obviously some of them are Hindu, some of them are Muslim, etc., etc., and a rumor went around that the cartridges were being laced with uh, with cow fat and with pig fat, right? So respectively, you know, like the Hindus and the Muslims are going to get very annoyed at that because obviously those are like like you know for the for the Hindus like uh, it's it's you know cows are sacred and for Muslims obviously uh, 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 pigs are unclean. So this ended up causing a huge rebellion, uh, at, ended up killing lots of British people, and eventually ended up being crushed by the British army. Um, but what ended up happening is that the British uh, end up uh, disbanding. Uh, the, the East India Company and they end up taking direct control over uh, the, the whole of India right and this became known as the British Raj or the British Rule right so this was basically a situation right and in 1885 you end up having the Indian National Congress right which is still a political party which is about today but at that time it was more like a kind of political organization right so what you have to understand is that India has a very strict caste system so obviously you have you know, some people are like very, very high up and very pe some people are like very low and like it doesn't really change much. So what was happening with a lot of people from like the higher classes, it was that they were, you know, they were very rich and they were sending like their, their, their sons to be educated in like uh, boarding schools back in England and stuff uh, and, you know, going to Oxford and Cambridge and stuff, right? So he's a very like kind of um, highly educated, like middle kind of class or upper class uh, people. And so when they came back to India, they was like, okay, we basically want to administer the, the British Raj, right? It shouldn't just be all these English people who are running the place. We should have a say in like in in how uh, the the colonies basically run, and so that's how it kind of began. It wasn't really meant to at the beginning to be pro independent. However, over the preceding decades, what happened is that. You know, a lot more people uh, were more in favour of independence because they could see that the British weren't really giving them the kind of demands that they wanted. However, even in this time, you could start to see schisms between the, uh, the you know the Hindu majority and the uh, Muslim minority, right? So you know, Hindus making up about seventy five percent of of the total place, and uh, Muslims making up around twenty percent or so. Because obviously, you've got like you know Christians and and Buddhists and Sikhs and stuff in 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 India as well, and Jains and all the rest of it, right? So you've got all these different uh, uh, religious groups in there, but by and large, it's kind of split between uh, like you know Hindus and Muslims, and you can kind of see that on some of the the maps that we have here and stuff, right? So in 1905, you know the British, they were obviously uh, controlling all these different places, and one of the major places uh, was the presidency of Bengal, right? You know, so Bengal it was basically this huge, huge uh, region uh, which kind of you know encompassed a vast, vast number of people. The population there at the time was around 79 million, which is roughly the same as what Germany is today. So you imagine like that essentially being one state, right? So imagine like the state of California having that many people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or whatever. It's like so. 
it was quite difficult for people to kind of govern all of that. And also as well, like, you know, the differences between West Bengal and, and East Bengal were like really like, I don't know why I keep saying Bengal and Bengal, like kind of, it's Bengal, I don't know, wherever, like, um, but anyway, um, the differences between West Bengal and East Bengal are quite substantial. And for the most part, because Calcutta, uh, which was like the, the capital uh, uh, of the British Raj at that time, uh, that was uh, based in West Bengal. And so East Bengal wasn't really getting that much attention. And that was kind of a very undeveloped uh, uh, region, right? So the British, for purely administrative reasons, split it, right? And after the fact, they kind of was like, oh, snap, like, us splitting it, West Bengal is predominantly Hindu and East Bengal is predominantly Muslim, right? And, you know, it wasn't like how it is today where like, you know, like what basically became East Bengal is now modern day Bangladesh, which is overwhelmingly Muslim and, you know, West Bengal is overwhelmingly uh, Hindu. So it wasn't kind of a clear cut thing. Uh, so they they hadn't gone out of their way to kind of like do this right, and this is a kind of myth that kind of we kind of need to dispel that you know it was the evil British going more ha 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 let's do divide and rule because this is something we we're going to get into a bit later. But they're doing divide and rule, you kind of have to continue the rule of the people like kind of so there's no point in dividing people and then they go and get their independence right. That's not really part of the plan. Anyways, this is like it, people often make that kind of argument and stuff here, yeah, but like. As we've kind of shown in this video and will continue to show, the tensions are much, much longer and more entrenched than like anything that the, the British did. And if anything, you know, you can't divide a people if there isn't already some underlying tensions there anyway. So whether it was played up or not, et cetera, et cetera, that's, yeah. And also as well, you could see like the reaction uh, to this partition. So whereas the Muslims in uh, East Bengal were like, yes, finally, we kind of like get to kind of, um, you know, have more attention paid to us and, you know, uh, like, you know, things being more focused towards us, etc, etc. If East Bengal is split from West Bengal, then we as the Muslims kind of get a bit more of our interests, like, kind of, like, taken care of and stuff. Whereas, for the most part, the, the, you know, the Indian nationalists, yeah, who predominantly were Hindus, right, they're the ones who protested against, like, against this when it came to, you know, for, like, the British, right? So they're the ones who were going, no, we need to, you know, like, like you can't partition this, you, yeah, and they, they protested and, you know, all these kind of things. You know, so six years later, they end up uh, disbanding the, the partition of Bengal, and so, you know, West and East Bengal end up being uh, reunited. However, in 1905, so the year after the partition, you end up having the setting up of the All India Muslim League. And this was based in Dakar, uh, which is in uh, modern day Bangladesh. And so, you know, basically this partition yeah, had a huge catalyst here yeah, because, like, they could see that, like, you know, if India ends up getting independence, which at this point is what the, the INC uh, wanted, right? If they end up getting their independence, then the Muslims in uh, India are going to be a minority, right? And whereas the British are kind of evenly kind of, you know, ruling over everyone and stuff, right? If we're not having a situation where there's an independent India, you know, the Hindus, because they're 75% of the population, are always going to be dominant. And so, you know, their interests are always going to trump ours, right? And on top of that, there was many things where, you know, you obviously had a lot of like Hindu nationalists, you know, and like their opposition kind of varied uh, very much. So you had some people who were just like rioting and like passing laws about like the slaughter of cattle, which, you know, so Hindus, as we've said, like, you know, for them, cows are sacred, but for everyone else, they're like, it's just a cow dude, like it's not that deep. Um, so, you know, them having riots and like trying to pass laws to ban the slaughtering of cows for Muslims to adhere to, you know, that's kind of, things like that kind of really annoyed the, the Muslims. Also, there was proposals uh, for the, the, you know, the banning of, like, conversion to Islam and stuff. Um, and there was other things as well where, you know, some people were saying, oh, we need to completely, like, separate, like, uh, the, the Muslims. We need to have them as, like, second-class citizens. And some people were just saying, right, we just need to expel all the Muslims, right? So, with this range of opinions, and I'm not saying that this was the predominant view within the INC, yeah, within the Indian National Movement, yeah, and virtually like in the leadership, yeah, you had many people who wanted India to stay united, right? And they wanted a kind of a secular state like, as India today is, right? But the problem is that a lot of people, especially on like the lower levels of this, they wanted to basically, you know, suppress the Muslims and stuff, right? And so a lot of the Muslims saw this and was like, we need to protect ourselves. We need, like, increasingly, they was like, well, we need, at bare minimum, we need, like, autonomous, like, status, right? Um, you know, we need to kind of govern ourselves. Maybe there's, like, a common, like, defence and foreign policy and stuff, but we need to be able to govern ourselves. 
And as time went on, and as you go into the 1930s and onwards, the idea of independent Pakistan ends up being born. So Pakistan was born out of the idea of the so-called uh, two-nation uh, theory. So, okay, so first of all, we have to understand that Pakistan is an acronym. So it stands for like Punjab, Kashmir, Sindh. I can't remember all of them. Yeah, I have them on screen now. Sorry, Pakistanis, sorry. Um, but anyway, so the idea was that, you know, the, the, you know, the regions which were Muslim, uh, they would be kind of their own separate countries. Because, you know, whereas in Europe and other places around the world, it's more like, you know, nationhood is more defined by uh, ethnicity or it's more defined along like kind of uh, linguistic lines and stuff like different languages. In India, you know, the theory goes that uh, the main dividing thing is between religion, right? So you've got the Hindus on one hand and you've got the Muslims on the other hand, right? Now, obviously, there's debates about this because for instance people who are Bengalis whether they're Hindus or Muslims you know they might feel a kind of a shared kinship um, and the same thing with uh, Punjabis as well because uh, again it, it, like before the partition you end up having a lot of people on either side within both of these states. So during World War II, you know, like uh, uh, the Muslims tended to be less in favour of independence uh, because, again, as we've kind of said, this idea of like, uh, no, like the, the Hindus are going to basically uh, take over and stuff, right? And so, like, you can kind of see this in the uh, elections which took place. Yes, there were elections within India. Uh, I didn't really know that much beforehand before doing research for this, but it's interesting, yeah, the British allowed there to be uh, elections there. Uh, not everyone could vote, though. That's something that's very important to know. Only a handful of people could vote. But either way, within uh, this thing, you can already see from, you know, from 1945, 1946, you can already kind of see that, like, you know, on, like, regional and on national elections, you can already see there's a division between the places which are voting for the Indian National Congress, which is, you know, the, the, the Hindu majority pro, like, India, like, kind of a, a segment, and then also the uh, Muslim League, yeah, like, who are predominantly uh, in what's today Pakistan and Bangladesh. So you can not really kind of see, like, the writing on the wall, right? And it didn't help that in 1946, Jinnah, uh, who was the, the leader of uh, the, the, the Muslim League, he ended up calling for a day of direct action or something along those lines and this was meant to be you know a peaceful kind of uh, demonstration uh, for like muslim solidarity however it ended up like descending into violence and you know you end up having lots of clashes between you know the, the muslims and like the the the, the hindus and like the sikhs etc so the British in the meantime are all like uh, caught in the middle of this. So obviously you had people like Churchill beforehand, yeah, like and like he, you know, the, those are the famous like Bengal uh, famine in uh, 1943. So he was very much like, even when it was unfashionable to be pro uh, like uh, empire and stuff, yeah, like he was like really, really staunchly for that and, and very bad views about the Indians and stuff. We won't go into that now, but anyway, that's just a side note, yeah. But the government that came after uh, Churchill, which was, you know, the Clematley, you know, this like the, the you know, the Labour government um, uh, after the war, they did not want to divide India. And this is something, again, which kind of dispels that myth. You know, so uh, Lord Mountbatten, uh, who was the, the last Viceroy of India, he was sent out there with the expressed uh, thing of like, right, you are not going to be dividing uh, India. If they ask for partition, you're not doing that. And there's going to be a withdrawal from India in June of 1948, right? So in the meantime, you're just like keeping the peace and, you know, that, that, that's all your, your job is. And Mountbatten had that idea for when he first kind of got out there. However, as time went on, he very quickly was like, oh, actually, this is not going to work out, right? You know, you've got the Hindus asking for, for partition, you've got the Muslims asking for partition. At some point, we're going to end up having to do a partition, right? And for the most part, this was relatively going to be a straightforward thing because, like, you know, you had different, like, regions within India and also you had, like, princely states as well. So, you know, the idea was that, okay, like, like each of the different places, they can decide whether they want to go to Pakistan or whether they want to go to India, right? However, the big problem, as we said before, was with regard to Bengal and with uh, Punjab because you had many people on either side of, of that uh, who were, you know, yeah, some places were the majority Hindu, which would later be in the Pakistani bit and vice versa, right? So the problem with all this is that, the, you know, the guy who they got to draw the line, as far as I'm aware, had only been to India that one time. Uh, so he'd never gone along the border uh, that he was drawing. And so what he ended up basically doing is going, yeah, okay, we'll draw a little border there, right? And and that was based on like the censuses like from from like several like years from before, right? And the problem is that obviously people living on the ground there, right? You know, 
you got people within the same village, you've got people from the same town, within the same city who are different. So uh, when you're drawing borders and stuff, this is what kind of discussed in, in like the, the Irish video and stuff, it's very difficult if it's not people on the ground who are doing it themselves. Like if it's someone from a far distant capital drawing the border, it's going to get messed up. And so people end up waking up one morning and be like, oh, we're on the wrong side of the border. We better pack our stuff, kids, and let's go, right? And so as a consequence to this partition, which was actually sped up, you know, six months earlier, yeah, because the, the British were like, right, we, we're trying our best here, but we, we don't think we're going to be able to, to keep like a, a lid on this. Yeah, you know, they want partition, let's just partition it and then let's just leave. Right. Uh, so they gave India and Pakistan their independence you know, six months earlier than, than they originally planned for. Right. So a lot of the people kind of argue, oh, the British should have stayed there for longer. But then it's like, hold on, but you guys wanted independence in the first place. So, like, we left six months earlier than you wanted, and then you're still complaining. But if we'd stayed for an extra six months, you still would have complained. Whatever it is, yeah, like, some people would have still complained and stuff, yeah. Like, not defending the British in India, as I've discussed in my other videos about, you know, what if the British never uh, ruled India, and, like, well, what if the, uh, Britain never had an empire? I've already explained my stance on empires. They're bad don't do it it's bad okay uh, but the point is that you can't have your cake and eat it or you kind of go we want independence but then we're also going to blame the british when independence didn't work out the exact way that we wanted and with this partition you're not having a situation where you had uh, up to 10 to 20 million people being displaced right so there was ended up being big like uh, population transfers and this again didn't necessarily need to happen uh, but it was a thing where they was like okay like we are going to do this and so the people like voluntarily left because in in many cases it was a thing where there ends up being riots and like and like and like just massacres and stuff and so people kind of fled in terror and this is why between one and two million people are estimated to have died uh, during this partition so it's really really terrible and stuff right so basically the point of this video is what if all that didn't happen and as unlikely as that is i think this is one of the first videos where it's like this would never have happened and it's like i can't even think what the turning point would be like there is no kind of turning point for this, unfortunately. People would have just had to have gone like, let's just all hold hands and live together. Because there's no other way of redoing it. You can't really have a pinpoint time because even decades before it was going to get into a second, yo, listen to some of these quotes here and you'll kind of see what I'm getting at. So I'm now going to read some quotes, yeah. First of all, uh, one from a Muslim leader uh, who is uh, Sayyid Ahmed Khan. Uh, so this is a very prominent person who kind of came up with like the, the two nation theory. And these are a series of speeches which he made over several years uh, in like the uh, 1880s. And then the second one is going to be from Val, Val I'm not going to pronounce his first name, apologies. I've never come across that name before, but it's Mr. Patel, right? Okay, so it's a very prominent uh, person. Uh, this was, you know, he's actually the largest statue in the whole world is actually made of him, and it's like the Statue of Unity, and it's, you know, basically to pay homage to him and like the the prominent role that he played in Indian uh, independence. You know, who's one of the first Indian nationalists who kind of came to terms with the fact of no matter what we want, you know, the, you know, the, the Muslims are going to be, uh, you know, partitioned away from us, so we're just going to have to put up with it, right? So the first bunch of quotes are going to be from uh, Saeed Ahmed Khan and the second are going to be from uh, Patel. Uh, apologies, I can't say his first name. Friends in India, there are two prominent nations which are distinguished by the names of Hindus and Muslims. Just as a man has some uh, principal organs, similarly these two nations are like the principal or, uh, limbs of India. Now suppose that all the English were to leave India, then who would be the rulers of India? Is it possible that under these circumstances, two nations, Muslim and Hindu, could sit on the same throne and remain equal in power? Most certainly not. It is necessary that one should conquer the other and thrust it down. To hope that both could remain equal is to desire the impossible and inconceivable. The aims and objects of the Indian National Congress are based upon an ignorance of history and present day politics. They do not take into consideration that India is inhabited by different nationalities. They presuppose that the Muslims, the Marathans, the Brahmins, the Zerik Zer, many other people, the Sikhs, the Bengalis, the, 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 can all be uh, treated alike and all of them belong to the same nation. The Congress thinks that they profess the same religion, that they speak the same language, that their way of life and customs are the same. 
I consider the experiment which the Indian National Congress wants to make fraught with dangers and suffering for all the nations of India, especially for the Muslims. You know, so that's what Syed Ahmed Khan was saying back in the 1880s, right? So obviously, you know, Pakistan gets independence in 1947. So you can see, even if we start this timeline as like, you know, far back and I go, oh, what if it changed then? You can really see this is, you know, very right, prominent feelings yeah, amongst many of the Muslims, even as far back as this time. So now we're going to look at the quotes from uh, Mr. Patel, and we can see with this, right? I fully appreciate the fears of our brothers from the Muslim majority areas. Nobody likes the division of India, and my heart is heavy, but the choice is between one division and many divisions. We must face facts. We cannot give way to emotionalism and sentimentality. The working committee has not acted out of fear. But I am afraid of one thing, that all our toil and hard work these many years might go to waste or prove unfruitful. My nine months in office have completely disillusioned me regarding the supposed merits of the cabinet uh, mission plan, except for a few honourable exceptions. Muslim officials from the top down are working for the League. The communal veto given to the League in the mission plan would have blocked India's progress at every stage. Whether we like it or not, de facto Pakistan already exists in the Punjab and Bengal. Under the circumstances, I would prefer a de jure um, a Pakistan, which may make the League more responsible. Freedom is coming. We have 75 to 80% of India, which we can make strong with our genius. The League can develop the rest of the country. So you see here just how entrenched the feelings are between both sides are yet. Yeah. So you can see that even, uh, you know, the, the Indian nationalist, yeah, even he's kind of coming to the terms of the fact of, you know, we don't want this to happen, but at the end of the day, we've got the majority of the country. The Muslims want to have their own bit, let them have their own bit. But we're going to look today, fast forward with all this kind of, all these tensions and all this kind of division and stuff, and imagine what, South Asia would look like today if it was United, because obviously, you know, we're not including uh, Nepal or Bhutan, and we're not including uh, Sri Lanka, uh, you know, so we're just talking here about India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Well, first off, this country would have the largest uh, population of any country on earth. It would have about 1.7 billion people, yeah, if you add up, you know, all these different places. But again, the overwhelming majority of these people would be from India, right? And also as well in terms of religious makeup, you know, again, as we saw with the days of the British Raj, overwhelmingly the population would be a Hindu, right? However, something to note is in terms of the economy, it would have one of the largest economies on earth. So India, as far as I'm aware, has already overtaken the United Kingdom. Uh, but if they combined uh, their GDP with that of uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan, uh, from memory, they would have an economy roughly the same size as that of Germany, maybe even slightly larger. Uh, so this would be around uh, 3.4 or 3.5 trillion uh, dollars, right? So it would be quite substantial. But something to note is that, you know, uh, the standard of living in India, yeah, in terms of, well, if measured by its uh, GDP per capita, is much higher than it is in Pakistan and Bangladesh. And actually, what we find with a lot of the statistics here when it comes to uh, like this general region is that Pakistan tends to be on the lower end of nearly all the things here. So it tends to be poorer, there's less people who are educated, uh, there's a higher rate of people who uh, uh, you know, marry within like the, their like first cousins and stuff, which is like just a weird kind of a cultural thing. Well, not weird, uh, it's a different cultural thing. Let's be, you know, let's be all progressive and stuff. It's a different cultural thing to be marrying your cousins. Um, you know, so, and then also the kind of, uh, the genetic kind of, complications that that can kind of cause that tends to be predominantly in Pakistan uh, so you know there's lots of different issues with that but at the same time you know the region would have a lot more peace it would have a lot more cooperation you know like kind of at the moment like it's very difficult to kind of like uh, pass between Pakistan and uh, India because of like the tensions that they still have ongoing and stuff and also as well you know China has a lot of influence within Pakistan um, and so India and Pakistan are always clashing with each other because of like this and you know it makes the whole region a lot more complicated even with like what was going on in, in Afghanistan at the moment you know uh, the, the Afghan uh, government that they had before was like like uh, more friendly towards the the Indians yeah whereas the Taliban now tend to be more friendly towards the Pakistanis right so a lot of that region would have a lot more of a kind of homogenous kind of uh, foreign policy and a lot more of a kind of homogenous uh, culture and stuff so would there still be tension between the different religious group yes absolutely yes and I don't think that 
even if there hadn't been a partition at this point, I think there would have been a partition at some other point. Because, you know, even uh, West Pakistan and East Pakistan, you know, they end up splitting in 1971, and that's how Bangladesh ended up being formed. So I don't really see, you know, if it didn't split in 1947, somewhere down the line it was going to split anyway. And so that's basically the conclusion of this video. Um, it's, yeah, it's, sorry we couldn't have had a more happy kind of ending and stuff, but... You know, that's the thing with history. Yeah. Sometimes, as much as it's nice to kind of live in the world of fantasy, and it's, you know, it's interesting doing the alternative history, you could go, oh, what if this had gone slightly different? Maybe history would have gone differently. But unfortunately, as we always kind of say, that would never have happened, you know, because it's just, yeah, unfortunately, what ended up happening is the most likely thing that would have happened. But it's still interesting to, to, to think about and stuff, right? And I hope that you've learned quite a bit about uh, India and stuff. And I, I really I, I hope in the comment section people are respectful and stuff. I don't want people to be like, oh, well, you're, just, you're just British and you're blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, just if you're going to speak about it, just be very calm and very you know, constructive with your criticisms. I'm happy to check any things that, that, that people, you know, got... You know, history is about the debate between different sources and stuff, right? Um, so I'm more than happy to have those kind of debates. Uh, so anyway, the next video is going to be a choice between uh, Biafra, right? So as we said before, what if it, uh, Biafra had been uh, independent? Uh, you know, so this is talk about the Biafran civil war and like how it would have affected different places in Africa, like you know, post-independence. And the other one is going to be on... Uh, you know, what if uh, there was basically a scramble for China? So in the same way you had a scramble for Africa, at a certain point there almost could have been a scramble for China, uh, roughly around the same time as well. So let me know in the comment section whether uh, you'd, uh, which of those videos you prefer. And also as well, don't forget uh, to hit the like button and uh, share with your friends. We're trying to get to 50 likes per video now, so you know, raise the bar. And uh, also as well, follow us on uh, Instagram. That's where we can you can see uh, all of our, uh, like our postings and stuff. And also like uh, for our merchandise as well. If you want to, if you're interested in merchandise, basically hit me up on that, and like we can go from there. And on top of that as well, we also have a uh, Patreon on account so link in the description if you want to like help out the channel and yeah so in the meantime have a great day and bye